This is The Baseline, discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. Welcome everybody, you're tuned to The Baseline, Callie Warren Shaw discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. No pandemic can hold the game down and we have got a great show on tap to talk basketball and we're not just talking about basketball from the dude side of things man if y'all weren't paying attention the wnba draft selection took place over this past weekend so much good stuff man sean and myself we had an opportunity to check it out but we felt it best the best way for us to have a conversation about what's going on right now with regards to the league we got to bring somebody on who knows what's happening so my man shaw hit the phones digging hard i mean he was almost like drew rosenhaus man on working it and uh, of course my man comes through let me go ahead and roll out the red carpet to my right hand man www.shawsports.net big kahuna pnc my brother from another mother mr warren uh, aka drew rosenhaus shaw in the house what's good brother you know me man always hustling every day and just trying to make sure that our show stays fresh actually i should like call you tomatoes. i should call you warren maverick shaw <laughs> so, so. <laughs> I, I need some of that maverick carter money i yeah, wish yeah. i had a little <laughs> like that but trying to make sure my connect stayed deep and thankfully you know we have an amazing guest reached out to her no hesitation she's ready to jump on so i'm excited as always to bring one of our friends on to the podcast here and let some of our fil- are some of our listeners who may not be as familiar with some of the great connections that we have out there to give this give this young lady a platform so it's going to be an amazing show Go ahead and you know make sure you introduce her and make sure you introduce her right, my dude. Oh, come on, man. I feel insulted by you I, even insinuating oh, that. Oh, I, I know. You know what? You know, it gives, gives me reason for pause because at the end of the day, you know, if our fans and listeners pay attention, how many times does somebody say, That's the greatest intro I've ever had? Can you follow me around? <laughs> I feel like that is like your signature thing, dude. So I know you're gonna do it right, man. Well, listen, happy, I, I, I personally feel like she needs no introduction. Uh, she is definitely one of the up and coming, but more importantly, just really solid, grounded uh, insiders covering the WNBA. Christina Williams from Girl Talks, uh, Girls Talk Sports TV is going to be jumping on board. She's going to help us break down the WNBA draft and really help us give insight on why this is such an exciting time if you are a follower not of the WNBA but also if you're someone looking forward towards the WNBA taking place after this pandemic she's got it on lock we've got her on board and we cannot wait to bring her on to talk WNBA basketball and the draft also we are going to be talking about uh, some upcoming news that's been taking place with the NBA and the G League they have revamped their development program some big news news following so be sure to hop on after our great interview with christina williams we'll be in discussions with that so once again great show on tap the stars are aligned properly everything is right for us to get you all hyped up to talk basketball once again get on my man shaw at shaw sports nba or get at me at game face lead the show's twitter handle at nba baseline available on all the major platforms you know where to find us uh be sure to locate If you're using whatever platform to listen to podcasts, locate the Baseline NBA podcast, add us to your playlist, and allow us to be your your go-to resource discussing all things happening in the association. Also, make sure for our Dash and listeners, the Baseline NBA show is available on Dash Radio under the Nothing But Net Radio Network. Tuesdays, 1 p.m., you know we are your afternoon drive to get you right for everything going on regarding NBA, WNBA, all kind of basketball. We talk that talk so you can walk that walk. So be sure to get us on lock for our people on Dash Radio. You know how we do. You know how we roll. Let's talk WNBA with the van glorious Christina Williams here on The Breakdown. Time to break it down. Put down put the bone gristle. Time now for The Breakdown. Cal Lee Warren Shaw, the Baseline NBA podcast. And to uh, top off... Um, really what is going to be a uh, very hectic week when it comes to discussions regarding basketball, period. But more specifically with everything that has happened over the course of this past weekend with the WNBA draft uh, that just finalized, um, we have really one of the premier writers. She's been featured on Essence Magazine a few months ago. Uh, She is definitely on the come up. If you guys are not familiar with her show, it's Girls Talk Sports. You can catch her on Instagram at girlstalksports.tv. We have the immaculate 
Christina Williams on board to help us break down the WNBA draft. Christina, thanks for hopping on board with us this week. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm super excited to chat with your viewers about drafts and all things happening in the W this season. Absolutely. And listen, you are a, a woman about things right now, not just because you, you live in the <laughs> NY area, but you are definitely got your your hands, you know, in the in the in the in the mud, uh, digging up mm -hmm. all kinds of good stuff for our listeners and just people in general who are keeping up with everything happening with the WNBA. I believe sometime this week you are going to be featuring an exclusive interview uh, with a said player. Uh, go ahead. Yes. Just talk about that, man. Like, wh oh, wh where, where are we going with this, Christina? I'm so excited about uh, my interview coming up with Indiana Fever's Erica Wheeler. If you're not familiar with who she is, she was named the 2019 WNBA uh, All-Star MVP. She was someone who was undrafted into the league. So, you know, her story is so unique. And I can't wait to have her on Girls Talk Sports TV Live on Instagram this Wednesday at 3 p.m. So I'm super excited um, to have her on. And, and what's remarkable, um, and you just highlighted this, is the fact that she's undrafted. And she mm -hmm. has a, a story. She has a background that I think any and everybody um, who is passionate, not just about sports, but just in general, uh, that right. if you are, you know, diligent, you, you're perseverant, you believe in what it is that you're doing, um, that you can achieve anything. And, and, it, and it's amazing because one of the things that I think is awesome right now in this time we're dealing with regarding this pandemic is the accessibility that athletes are making themselves towards, not just the media, but just people in general. And I'm sure that you are absolutely psyched, you know, about having a, 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 a woman like uh, Erica Wheeler kind of really dig into a lot of things that she has been, you know, I'm sure wanting to kind of let out since becoming the MVP and, and since the end of this, this previous season and what she's looking forward to if and, you know, when the WNBA resumes activities and she's back out there on the basketball court playing for her team. Yeah, I think Erica, her story is so unique and like she's the epitome of what happens when you just don't give up. And so I'm excited to have her on to tell her own story um, just to inspire people, especially during a time like this where it can't be so hard that people would give up or you only see the negative things in the news and things like that. So I just want to drop a little positivity on the timeline uh, and highlight her story and definitely. give her a spotlight. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Well, we appreciate it. I don't think there's probably going to be a better uh, person leading that Q&A session uh, than yourself, Christina. So let's go oh, ahead. Thank and, you, guys. <laughs> let's go ahead and, and, and dig right in. Um, WNBA draft um, over and done with featured, um, you know, ESPN really, you know, did a, a great job, a fantastic job of really profiling uh, the WNBA over this weekend. I thought that, you know, they really were the talk of the town um, for sports in general because they actually rolled out the first ever virtual WNBA draft. And Sean and myself, we had an opportunity to listen to Kathy Engelberg, who's the commissioner, uh, prior mm -hmm. to the, the draft. And she, she had a media availability call. And really, her the way that she came off to me made me and my boy Shaw feel like, man, I really do think like this is going to be successful. I do think that there is definitely energy and heart being put into this. I want to get your take, though. What was your overall feel of, of watching the draft play out, um, seeing that the athletes, uh, you know, the, the honoree draft picks before the draft selections took place, um, Engelbert's presence, you know, presenting. The, what was your overall feel about the draft and, and how you think it went down? So my overall impression of the draft is that it was done amazing, especially since it was the first ever virtual draft in sports history. I believe that the WNBA um, the way they did it and had it structured that other leagues, such as the NFL, can definitely learn from them and, and take some notes. Kathy Engelbert, the commissioner of the WBA, uh, I think for her kind of first year, she's been faced with a lot. You had the CBA and now you had this pandemic, which was unprecedented, and she was able to make it happen. Um, I'm so happy that the league decided to still go forth with the draft and not postpone it because it really put eyes on 
and spotlight on women's basketball. And I felt like because of the pandemic, we saw a lot of people being engaged with uh, the WNBA and, and these women and the college players uh, and with number one as a trending topic on Twitter. Did you guys um, catch a window of Sabrina and Nescu and how her jersey sold out on draft night, her WNBA draft jerseys, Nike uh, fanatics, they put it up for sale and it sold out as soon as her name was called. So I thought that was like a highlight of the draft as well. Um, you, that's like unheard of a, a women's basketball jersey selling out in a matter of seconds. That the Liberty has a win the next day, put out pre orders for her game day jersey, which will be shipped in September. I think it's just great that the league was able to still pull off the draft. That's a huge win, not only for women's basketball, but for women's sports. So the WNBA had a huge job, you know, as you alluded to, being the first professional league to kind of enter the spotlight since the pandemic started, having to do the first ever really virtual draft. A lot was on the league's shoulders. They even decided to take on the responsibility of doing another kind of uh, honorarium, if you will, to Kobe and Gigi and, you know, people mm-hmm. lost in the helicopter crash. What were some of the highlights you think of kind of the auxiliary components of the WNBA draft that was on virtual? Well, first and foremost, you mentioned Kobe and Gigi. Um, the league did a really great tribute to Kobe, Tiana, and the others who were killed in that horrific crash back in January. But also, they used that time to um, not only use it as a charitable moment, but also keep that mama mentality and that legacy to live on within women's basketball. The league introduced the OB and GG Advocacy Award. And basically what that award will do is it will award any individual or influencer who uses their platform to grow the game. And so anyone, the field is open for who can receive that award. So I think that that tribute was done very beautifully. I think that um, the virtual draft also gave the audience a chance to see and uh, the real authentic kind of atmosphere with the players. We were able to go into the players' homes or a bunch of Instagram lives going on. So it really made the draft personable. Um, and like you had a, sneak, uh, a little peek into um, that from a behind the scenes access point. So I think that the draft was done great, of course, with live TV and live production. You can't really predict what would happen with technical issues. Um, WNBA Twitter, I saw a lot of people going off about how and some of the later uh, draft picks, they didn't really get attention and how the names are just going across the screen, going across the screen and how um, on the flip side of that, they didn't get the recognition that they deserved because it was a virtual draft. Um, and I'm 50-50 on that. I mean, in previous years, the later rounds have been able to have that same kind of process go back and forth with getting um, the names across the screen. Um, but also, I think that ESPN gave the WNBA a longer block in TV. They had two hours as opposed to 30 minutes. So, you know, longer time to, like, analyze the game, um, discuss the top draft picks, and really introduce those girls to the world. So I think it was done great in that sense. So one of the things that, you know, in, interested me in some aspects, and I do want to take this, and I'm not trying to speak from a place of ignorance, so to speak, but what is WNBA Twitter like? And in moments like this, where even some of like the delayed reactions of some of the draft picks, maybe they didn't hear their name called, and I forget which pick it was, but I remember her whole family was just <laughs> sitting there just looking like, like nothing had even happened. So yeah. do, do we get the same type of like even memes and kind of, you know, jokes that people make, you know, with whether whatever sport it would be that happened in the WNBA as well? Yeah, you see exactly that happen. <laughs> Part of WNBA Twitter, the real um, reactions from content creators, broadcasters, fans. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's great to have it there because you get to have that real conversation with with people in the women's basketball community. Um, but I, I don't think you can blame the league or ESPN for what happened. You can't really predict, you know, technical issues. Um, I think it's just great that the league was able to still pull off the draft on Friday. And that's a huge win, not only for women's basketball, but for women's sports, period. So um, I don't think that, I mean, obviously in real time, WMA Twitter, they were talking about it and really upset about the later draft picks not getting the same, um, you know, attention. But there's only a two-hour block, right? And you have TV, two hours is 
not a lot of time to get through 36 picks and give each person the same amount of attention. So I think that ESPN and the WNBA did a really great job in, in how they structured the format of of the draft. And if people want to find out more about the draft pick, then it's on the media, right, to tell those stories. Christina Williams joining us here on the Baseline NBA podcast. And all right, so let's talk about the draft, right? Like, to me, um, a lot has been riding on this because in, in – you know, I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm ignorant in saying this, but this was really one of the most uniquely um, embraced draft processes, I think, in, in recent years. And I think the reason why I'm saying that is because one team, the New York Liberty, okay, they they essentially have four <laughs> picks. Yeah, they have four <laughs> picks. In, in 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 out of the first twelve, okay, the right. Dallas Wings, right. I believe, had three. I'm not sure if they were supposed mm-hmm. to have four, but they had three. And essentially, uh, so basically, there was a, a team. There was a big blockbuster trade at night yeah. before the WNBA draft, where New York Liberty said it was a three team deal. So New York Liberty sent Tina Charles to the Washington Mystics, which is still being talked about. Drastic. Right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that's why New York ended up with more picks in the first round, but. Um, I think Dallas really came out huge <laughs> well, in the draft. Well, the, because of these, because of these picks, and I want to get your perspective on this. Because of mm-hmm. all of this movement that is that has taken place, this was really a highlight on we're. Ro- I mean, we're really you know, if you're the New York Liberty, if you're the Dallas Wings, we believe in this year's draft class. I mean, it's not just about. Sabrina Ionescu, okay? Everybody knows what she is going to go to New York to help do, not just for the game itself, but also for the market that New York is supposed to present for the (laughs) WNBA. But everyone else, uh, Satu Sabali, um, Cox, Carter, all all of this is saying this is probably going to be the deepest, the best draft class because between not just those two teams, but everyone who is selected out of those 12, everybody is going to get significant contributions for all all of these teams, mm-hmm. because all of these teams literally struggled this year, uh, this this past season, um, and right. and yet and still they may not even still it still be two three years down the road before we may actually see these teams playing in some like making a deep run in the playoffs. Honestly, there's only 144 spots in the WNBA, so it's going to be hard for a lot of these teams who had all of these picks to even sign some of these um, draftees to contract because there's only 12 roster spots on each team. So. Dallas is going to have a really hard time with trying to in training camp to see who they keep and who do they let go. Um, that's the downside of the draft. It's such a deep class. Who do you keep? Who do you let go on the rosters? And a lot of the rosters are already stacked. So it'll be interesting to see what happens when the season starts, who kind of makes it out on each roster. But um, yeah, it's lots and WNBA free agency was crazy. A lot of different moves. The Dallas Wings needed to rebuild because Monty McKee Stafford, she is taking two years off to attend law school. You have Skylar James Smith playing in Phoenix. So this draft was really what the Dallas Wings was banking on to recreate a foundation around Arike Agumbawale. So, um, and I think they made out huge with their picks, with Ty Harris, um, Atu Sabali, and Bella. I think they did a great job, um, and the future of Dallas will be great. <laughs> To say the least, yes. <laughs> and, and let's talk about your hometown and kind of everything that's kind of going on there with this in, in, with the draft. <laughs> Have you ever seen this? And and again, we'll, while we don't regularly follow the league and some of these things we could just Google, I have you here. I'm going to ask, mm-hmm. has there ever been a time where there's six picks were controlled by two teams, you know, in the first round? Is that something that has happened before? Obviously, we've seen people get multiple picks, but when there's only 12, you know, 12 teams go around or 12 picks in the round to begin with, <laughs> And six of them go to two teams. Is right. that something that's unprecedented for WM for the WNBA? Not really. I mean, I think most mm-hmm. of it came from the WNBA free agency, which has been happening for since February. Mm-hmm. And so, like, there was a lot of movement in free agency. Uh, a lot of pieces that were moved from those teams and acquired draft picks. And so that's why they ended up with so many. But I think that, especially for women's basketball, right in New York City, we've had a lot of rough seasons. Yeah, I interviewed Amanda Zowie B um, last week, and she was talking about the growing pains with the New York Liberty and wanting to make that playoff run this season. And I think having Sabrina, a player like her, come to New York, it definitely like 
kind of re-energizes and brings up more momentum for the New York Liberty. And then we have a new coach or under new ownership. We have a new arena in the Barclays Center and really the support of the Brooklyn Nets and the NBA. And so I think we're entering a new era of the New, of new York Liberty basketball. And it'll be great um, to see how that unfolds. Uh, the Liberty, they have uh, Kia Nurse. They have Asia Drew. So a, a really guard-heavy team, right? Um, but I definitely think that with Sabrina adding, adding in, that the Liberty definitely have a chance to make a playoff run. Christina Williams joining us here on the Baseline NBA podcast. You be sure to catch her and her team as they uh, do it live. Girls Talk Sports TV. Uh, you can catch her on Twitter uh, at Christina2334. So, so Christina, like usually, you know, one of the things that really stick out to me is when teams are normally drafting, you're usually drafting mm-hmm. for the future or you're drafting for the now. When I look at when I look at the selections that were made in this first round, um, aside from the Liberty and aside from the Wings, which team do you think address the needs for them to continue making their push coming out of that first round that you said that player going there is going to help them move another notch closer, you know, to possibly playing. Um, in the final. How can you not think about Kennedy Carter? The manager just recently, uh, Angel McCarthy, she was signed to the LV aces and free agency. And so they really needed someone who can score and a proficient guard. And so when you add Kennedy Carter into that situation, someone who's been averaging 20 points uh, per game since her freshman year um, in college, I think that she would definitely help revitalize that franchise and really help them get and make a playoff run. Um, so I'm excited to see how Kennedy translates into the W. I think that she was the still in the draft for the dream and that she has the potential to be the rookie of the year. So you heard it here first. Uh, I'm calling yeah. it. I think that like Kennedy it. Carter will. <laughs> we like will, when will, we, we like when our guests make predictions, <laughs> man. Because when you when you when you're right, we gonna blow that thing up all over on the social media spaces. It's like, hey, don't don't act like you didn't hear her say this once. She said it when it was with Shaw and Game Face Lee. So I like that. I like that. Right. I mean, Kennedy. She's a great scorer, especially under pressure. She showed what she could do in the, um, the USA games versus the college teams. Um, she was able to lead her, her team to some wins this season and break records. So I think that we should definitely keep an eye out for what for what she's going to do in Atlanta. Definitely on draft night, we saw the support of everyone in the music industry to the NBA players. Trey Young had tweeted out congratulations to her. Lil Wayne said he's getting some season tickets. So I definitely think that Kennedy Carter will be the still of the draft and she will – um, you know, help the Atlanta Dream improve their win record because they had a losing season and also help them get to the playoffs. Big vibes there. So as you talked about, you know, the steal of the draft, you know, who's somebody that was maybe a surprise in some aspects? The ESPN broadcast, you know, kind of alluded to Herbert Harrigan maybe going a little yeah. earlier than some would have expected. Is that something that we'd agree with in their assessment? That definitely was a surprise to me. I think I tweeted out unexpected on Twitter when she was <laughs> six, but only because um, we had a media call with all of the coaches prior to the draft and her name really didn't come up in those conversations. And when you look at all of the mock drafts from ESPN, W Insider, uh, High Coach Hoops, they didn't really have her that high up. So no one expected for uh, Kiki Herbert Harian to, you know, be chosen sixth overall, but Coach Reed definitely did say that she would choose the best available player. Um, and there was a call yesterday as well with uh, Kiki and, and Coach. And they talked about how Kiki had that mentorship with Sylvia Fowles and how she would fit in, helping them bring energy to the team and their overall defense. And so that was definitely a surprise. I definitely didn't expect Kiki to go number six overall. But really, with Gamecocks, uh, Kiki and Ty went back to back, so that was a surprise as well. I mean, everyone uh, thought that Ty would actually get signed to the Lynx, and I think even Ty thought that <laughs> uh, based on like the draft, the mock drafts, and like the discussions and stuff. But like to see those two women get drafted back to back, it shows one how great of a coach Don Staley is, and two, like you know what I mean, like. Um, how you just can't really rely on those things because you just never know what happens. So that was definitely a surprise. 
Um, and another surprise was uh, I, I didn't expect Terry Cooper to fall so low because, uh, you know, and, and, and especially in the, uh, the mock draft, she's uh, predicted to go a little bit higher. And I even made graphics and stuff, and I thought that she was going to be a little bit higher in the draft. So that was a surprise to see that she fell so low in the draft as well. So I, I want to follow up on what you were just talking about, Christina. With Harrigan being selected as high as she did, how much did that upset the apple cart? Um, the fact that Ruthie actually went higher in the draft, a lot of people had her projected to go to Seattle at 11. So the fact that she actually went to Chicago was kind of a shocker as well. Um, so I think that it kind of aligned with it. And then when Coach Wade spoke about her game and how excited he was, he was even surprised that no one picked her up a little bit earlier. Mm-hmm. So um, it was definitely a surprise. But I think that because of the hype around uh, Sabrina and Satu, you know, people just go, oh, okay, Ruthie's going to go a little bit higher. But I, I think that the team that she's on, she's perfect for, is still fitting well with um, what they do with uh, at that franchise in the Chicago side. All right, one of the things that I definitely want to find out about um, from you, Christina, is we didn't see um, – I mean, obviously, the international game is is still a work in progress. So right. we didn't, we haven't, we haven't. I mean, most of those you know players who are internationally based probably are coming from universities and or, or they will if they are making themselves direct. We didn't see any um, make any selections. I think until this until the second round. Um, so right. talk a little bit about where that is being is headed for because there were two players from Germany that were selected late in the second round by Dallas and Los Angeles. Right. So what are we talking about there with the international game for the WNBA? Well, that's still up in the air, right? There's a few international players who are in the W who still have a resign contract mm-hmm. with Cambridge being one, but I, I highly think that she will resign with the Aces. Um, Emma Meesterman, there's talks about what she will do for the season. And, and if that's why Tina Charles signed that one year deal is because Emma may not come back to play in the U.S. because of the coronavirus pandemic and what's happening. So we don't really know what's going to happen in terms of players' uh, availability when it comes to um, the WNBA in terms of international players. Um, and then, so all we can do as media members and followers of the league is asked questions to the coaches and, and franchises, but also make predictions. And so a lot of people are saying that Tina Charles signed that one year deal because Emma is not coming back to play. Mm-hmm. And so it'll be interesting to see how that unfolds, especially. And then you mentioned the Los Angeles Sparks roster, which is already pretty stacked. Candace Parker signed back NECA, Janae, Chelsea Gray, uh, Christy Tolliver just uh, got traded there. So they have a lot of veteran players. So it will be interesting to see what happens in training camp and who makes the cut because there are only 12 spots. So one of the things that interests me also about this is just as the league is trying to then put itself on pace to start at some point amidst COVID-19 as well. Mm -hmm. But what happens with these rookies and the, the coveted rookie transition program and things of that nature? How do these young ladies now get integrated into the culture of the WNBA in a time that's so different from it ordinarily would be? The league is still trying to figure that out in, in the wake of this pandemic, right? Um, for now, all we know on our side is that everything's postponed. The league was projected to start on May 15th, but we know that's not going to happen. Um, and so with that being said, With the Olympics being canceled, I think that there will be a great opportunity to, you know, for the league to format some sort of training camp around um, June or maybe July um, before it comes to worst and the league starts in August. But the league um, is still finding things out. So everything's day by day because with the coronavirus pandemic, we are getting new information and discoveries every day on what exactly the virus is. And, and so, like, it's interesting times for sure. <laughs> it's sports. Yeah, no doubt. And I think that Kathy is definitely handling this very well. Follow up to that question, you know, with that said, did, do you think the league maybe gained a little bit of an advantage maybe even by, as you said, not canceling the draft? You're hearing the NBA, you don't know what's happening with their draft yet, but there's potential <laughs> right. for pushing that back. You know, the NBA goes ahead and moves forward and now has their players at least proverbially in place to join their respective teams. Do you feel? Do you see that as an advantage for the league when things ultimately do resume? I think that it definitely has been an advantage to not postpone the WNBA draft and to really work with what they had in making it a virtual draft. 
I think it definitely increased the exposure of the league. As I said uh, in the beginning of this, um, you saw outlets who've never covered the W cover the W. You saw segments on the jump and on different um, shows that really cover male sports, cover the WNBA and really build the hype and anticipation around that. But when you, and then you have a, a player, a generational player like Sabrina, right? The marketability of her and what she will mean to women's basketball and sports. Um, that definitely helps to have, you know, a stack draft class on Thursday where you can really delve deep and tell their stories. Um, so this is, this is an exciting time for women's basketball for sure. Um, I mean, this year has been great. We signed the new CBA in January. Um, so, and then like we have all these different changes and things happening. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see how the season unfolds. I don't think that the league will cancel the season only because they can't afford to. But I do think that if this pandemic, you know, slows down and we flatten the curve, it'll be postponed and maybe the league will start in August. Christina, my uh, my final question uh, for you is, you know, we don't, we don't like doing these winners and losers thing. I mean, that it's so cliche and played <laughs> out. We, I don't, Sean and right. myself, we really don't buy into that stuff. But I would like for you to highlight who are those X factor selections that came out of this year's draft. Okay, my X factor selections. I would have to say uh, Beatrice, mom premier, um, and she was selected to go to. I'm sorry. Yeah, for, for you. Sean, Sean, I, Sean and I, we have a we have a we have a, a cane thing going on at times. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think that she will definitely um, in the future be a great player in the W. And then if I had to choose Crystal Dangerfield, and it's kind of shocking that she actually went way way lower in the draft. Mm. Um, I think that with the Lynx trying to be, rebuild right around Nafisa. Sylvia is a vet, so we don't know like how much longer she'll play in the league. So I think having someone like Crystal Dangerfield on that roster will definitely um, be interesting and to see how she'll develop and translate into the W. I'm definitely keeping my eye on her as well. I was going to say Tay Cooper as well because uh, she definitely will address Phoenix's need um, and uh, maybe Phoenix Mercury will get very far in the playoffs too, because they have Skyler, they have Brittany Griner, Diana Tarazzi is returning, so they definitely help address their needs as well. So um, I'm excited for this season, and I really hope that it happens. I know that it will happen, and I hope that people will tune in, the same people who watch the draft and, and beyond. I hope that um, that interest carries on and that they um, they tune in this season, because it's going to be great basketball. Well, if there's any indication of that same kind of hype and enthusiasm that was presented to us in the draft, as would be one of their best correspondents and inside writers, as such Ooh. as yourself, Christina Whoa. Williams, um, I have no <laughs> doubt uh, this this season's WNBA season is going to be exciting for sure. Christina, we so appreciate you hopping on board with us um, to help break down the draft, really give us some great perspective with what these women are really helping us understand is that, you know, this is going to be a, 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 a season to remember so much positive stuff that is that is happening, right. even in a, when we're in a standstill they're still helping to make moves and we're so appreciative that you're covering it. And we're definitely looking forward to bringing you on when we get a little bit idea when that season starts, because you know, we got to start talking predictions, <laughs> right? We got to ride out with those WNBA oh, yeah. uh, conference predictions. Uh, who's making well, it? Who's faking it? I made a prediction here today. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh, yeah. No, 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 no. Don't, don't hit them too quickly now. We make, you got to let, gotta let it marinate for them. Let, let them. let them soak this in first. And then when the time comes, you got to hit them with the, with, 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 the, the, with the predictions, okay? Okay. Thank you so much for having me on today. It's been a pleasure. Be sure to follow uh, my Instagram, girlstalksports.tv, um, and me on Twitter at Christina2334. Most definitely. You're tuned to The Baseline. Cali Warrenshaw discussing the hot-button topics of the NBA, and this was The Breakdown. Time now for The Drop, Cali Warrenshaw Baseline NBA podcast. And our topic for The Drop will be involving the NBA and the G League. Now, people are familiar with the G League. It is a developmental program, um, essentially a league that is like the minors, you know, for the NBA. Um, and as ESPN's 
Jonathan Gibney and Adrian Wojnarowski are reporting the NBA and G League um, development program for its high school or for the top high school prospects have been restructured. And this also will include salary and incentives. One of the other major storylines that's taking place from this, Shaw, is the fact that they were able to ink deals with Jalen Green and Isaiah Todd for the G League, which I think is a huge, huge, huge win, win for their situation and their scenario. Um, but I think it also highlights more so the movement where the NBA is trying to trend towards restructuring the way that these prospects are going to try to make their way to the NBA. And certainly this is to me more of a transitional means of getting to that point. There's so many layers to this, my dude, including the one and done situation, which it looks like they're going to have to table right now. But now they're looking at a way to bring in and just, as you said, develop. They've, they've, G League is a developmental league, but they're, they've redeveloped their developmental program now as a result of bringing in guys like Green and Todd into the system. And for me, and I'm not trying to minimize it, and I can't, and I hope at some point we're able to get a G League official, official to come on the show and maybe dive into a little bit deeper but this is like they're going to create almost like an expanded aau team but with g league and, and nba coaches helping these young guys along and now that you see two top prospects to top prospects like Green and Todd join in this quote unquote revolution. Now you can see other players who may not be as heavily touted, but they may want to also take this route because it gives them some exposure now because Green and Todd are there. People are always going to be watching those guys. So now it gives you an opportunity to shine as well. Um, and I think this is a monumental move for, for the G league and the NBA and in partnership where they are going to get salaries and incentives that conclude up to $500,000 before these top prospects guys who are projected to go into the lot into the NBA lottery, you know, within a year or two. This is massive. You know, this is a huge, huge deal. And I think a big win for them is Sharif Durahim as the new commissioner, or president of the G League. He's come out and said that he didn't want to see guys like Lamella Ball and RJ Hampton go out, go elsewhere and play overseas when they could stay home and, and develop be developed in the in, into the NBA platform right away, right out of high school. So I, me personally, I think that this is great. I, it's funny because when you hear G League President Sharif Abdul Rahim express these type of sentiments, I think that there is a sincerity there. I think where part of the problem, big lie, is, is, you know, and Michelle, we've had other entities who are trying to figure out a way to attract these same type of players. Um, from you know the idea of not having the choice of going directly to the NBA because they're being forced to play in in college right and a lot of this to me is where it's how much of this is about genuinely cultivating these players their talents and not minimizing it because mentally you're forcing them to have to play in the college game the college system or even a developmental system how much of it is just keeping things at bay from them going to, you know, other places and play other countries and playing for extended period of time where people are losing out on the ability to see them, you know, you know, out there on the basketball court. It's kind of weird, Shaw. I feel like there's some there's genuine intention by some and some where some entities i think you still have to kind of scratch your heads and figure out what does this all all mean forget the money i'm just saying what does all of this mean what is this being driven by for these players well my dude you as you were talking you've given me a hellified idea you know at some point to maybe even bring on um we would need to get our guy ricky Vellante for the pcl or david west or solid out o'brien one of them maybe right. to come on and, and maybe have some conversations with the g league official to kind of see you know, what platform is better or is one that's better? Is it just a matter of preference? Are these truly competing entities for the what would be collegiate athlete in some aspect? We're trying to figure out the profitability of these of the of these players. Um, I don't think the PCL is going to be able to touch five hundred thousand dollars a year, you know, to top prospects like this. But for those other guys who I was re referring to in my in my previous soliloquy, so to speak, that would be trying to maybe jump on with Todd or Green as a result, just so they could get exposure. Is the PCL a more better option for them where maybe now they can shine out and potentially still get 
um, that those scouting options that, you know, that the league would be disseminating throughout, because if there's basketball being played, people are going to want to watch it one way or another. And if you're good, people are going to want to, you know, find, find a kind of data mine that information so they can bring it to the respective big, big teams. So I think it's a great opportunity potentially to, to, to utilize that in, in a larger platform, but it's a great question overall as to figuring out, okay, who really has these, these young men who has their best interest at heart? Yeah. So let's just kind of break a little bit more down. And, and this is, um, Shaw, you, you were able to locate this, um, via through hoops rumors and uh you know props to uh dana garuda uh for writing the article a week ago or almost a week ago with regards to this particular scenario so ultimately be, you know jalen and isaiah being signed these guys are slated to you know receive salaries and incentives that could exceed somewhere in the neighborhood of about half a mil okay and that's and that's nice where I think it becomes an interesting uh, dynamic here is that the way that this is supposed to play out is this is going to be a one-year development program conducted outside of the G League's team structure, their traditional structure. Um, and then rather than playing regular season games for a G League affiliate, they will join some veteran players and they will play exhibition games against G League teams, foreign national teams, and then a couple or a few NBA academies throughout the world. And so these exhibition games, they may come where any, they, they may, you know, amount to anywhere between 10 to 12 games. But in, a, in its essence, part of what's going to be interesting to me on that part, Shaw, is they're going to be out there playing. What will those statistics, what will those numbers truly mean? What will they translate to? Because... If you are a high school player coming directly into the NBA like you were Kevin Kevin Garnett, you like you're a Kobe Bryant, you're a LeBron James, those are years in which these numbers m will not analytically be applicable to your NBA career. So if you're somebody who obviously wants to attain, you know, be up there in the top five and the most points scored in, in, the, in, in the NBA in NBA history, top rebounds, top assists. I mean, this period, that year time, and may, some people may have, you know, questioned that, but I wouldn't. I'm, I'm, this is a year of your, your, you playing the game. You're not playing it where those numbers are going to accumulate to your career statistics, you know, like it would be, say, you were playing in the ABA conversion over to the NBA because this is not even considered G League. This is a, a developmental program off of the G League and the NBA. Yeah, and I think that's a very nuanced maybe um, conversation or detail about this this whole entire thing. I would take it maybe a step for, forward and maybe not worry so much about it from I don't know the the overall historical standpoint of 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 what they're doing in the G League. Specifically, because if they were to go overseas and let's say Lamelo Ball or whatever like that won a championship in whatever league he were, that can be taken into your overall conversation for the basketball Hall of Fame at some point. So maybe you lose him, but if these are all one and dones anyway, it's hard to say that that one year, like even if they were to go to college and you know win win an NCAA title, you know does does it really impact if you were only there for one year? Kind of almost as as in a higher gun for them, it's giving these players now the opportunity to. Uh, earn salary and, and start to help their families in their respective situations right out of high school because they are projected to be, you know, these multimillionaires at some point as well too. And the league, on its, at least on its face, gets to control that narrative, some, so to speak, and then bring them into the culture. Uh, one of the things that, that that's also being talked about right now is like Sam Mitchell, uh, a, a known guy to, to help and develop young players, um, and obviously has a, a large extent or breadth of NBA experience. He's looking to potentially be one of the first coaches for, you know, this offshoot of this professional development. And I think he'd be a great selection for, for these guys to help them build and understand the culture of the NBA. So I think I'm, I'm more excited about that than maybe them losing a year or an X amount of games of um, statistics, so to speak, that would go to the overall resume. Well, I will say this, and, and you had talked about this at the very beginning with regards to uh, G League President Sharif Abdul Rahim, in that he believes that the NBA is, and, and let me, I'm going to quote by what he says. He believes that the NBA is the best development system in the world, and those players shouldn't have to go somewhere else to develop for a year. They should be in our development system. 
And I think in, in just from my perspective, Shaw, one of the things that I want to take from this that I think is, is going to be positive is that if you are a player um, who wants to play in the NBA, when we're using this word development, what are we developing, right? It's not a question of whether or not they're talented enough to probably play in the NBA, but are they talented enough to be ambassadors, to be representatives for the NBA brand? And if there is something there in which a person like Sharif Abdurrahim is advocating on the sense that all of that can be done under our, our under our umbrella, under our our um under our wing. I gotta tell you, that is a lot of confidence um for for uh from coming from not just him, but also from his team, from the G League themselves. That's that, that's a lot of brass that you know to, to instill that type of confidence because you're rolling the dice that these guys, after this is all said and done, after this program is finito, they're gonna be the front runners. They are going to be the 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 you know essentially the, the 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 prototype for how they would want to move this thing forward and expand this beyond. So it'll be interesting to see if they can see it all the way through and that there's success that comes from this. I'm not saying that this is an experiment, but I am saying that, you know, for everybody involved, you hope that they do get this right. Um, because using the word development, it's you're threading a very thin line in how you're depicting these future players for the NBA, possibly. Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with calling it uh, an experiment. They're they're committed to it, I think, long term. Um, but it is experimental. We don't know how it's going to look. Just like you know, even going back to this this foolishness with the two K tournament and the horse competition, we don't know. We're trying something new, but this is a a calculated risk um, and direction that they want to move into, so that they can protect their brand, make sure that these young men are being developed in in the way that suits and 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 best exhibits an NBA professional. And and I commend them for at least trying to do that. And I'm sure there's going to be some hiccups along the way, as there are with any thing but on its face on its face it seems like a really good idea now once we get into the more nuanced things and more details about this and at the end of the day everything is still always about money and we'll see how much of an impact that plays into everything but it's money about it's money for these players as well and and, and does it put them maybe even maybe a little bit more at risk um you know being you know becoming quarter millionaires or whatever it is um, this early on you know, at 18 years old, so to speak. So I don't know. There's, there's, there's a lot that we still need to, to, to figure out about this situation, but uh, I am very interested to see um, how many teams or how many developmental teams it is. And while I was trying to be, you know, um, snarky by calling it, you know, a glorified AAU situation in some ways it is. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because I think these players can maybe continue to, to relate to that as they grow into that level of professionalism now and getting getting an NBA coach or coaches to kind of help and assist with that development is massive for them that they wouldn't necessarily have already gotten had they decided to go overseas or if they decided to go to college. All right. Well, we'll definitely keep our eyes peeled. And uh, I'm sure I'm putting it on you. We're going to have to make that happen. We need to bring some people on so they can explain themselves <laughs> with uh, with everything. That's you know, down. Bro, I, I like a good challenge. And I think our, our guy, Ricky, at the PCL, they're doing amazing things. They, they they reach out pseudo often. So I think we'd be able to maybe get them on. But we want to make sure that it's, it's cordial. We don't want anybody to feel like they're walking into an ambush one way or another. Right. I think it's great conversation and great content that I think our fans and listeners would really enjoy. And the public in general, high school, high school players that are graduating graduating and uh, potentially think about going to college. That's a conversation that they're going to be wanting to int be interested in as well as they try to make a decision about their own futures. As always, Brother Shaw, intriguingly laid out perfectly well. And we will definitely keep our eyes focused on the incremental changes and whether or not this does uh, become a success for the NBA and for the G League, respectively. You're tuned to The Baseline. Cal Lee, Warren Shaw, discussing the hot-button topics of the NBA. And this was The Drop. Coast, coast, coast. Coast, to coast. Time to go coast to coast discussing the news in the association. You ready to rock and roll, Mr. Shaw? Absolutely, man. Let's rock. All right. The NBA and NBPA have agreed to partial reductions of 25% of player salaries. That is expected to start 
May 15th. Well, everybody, as I said, you know what I mean? They had to figure it out at some point. And uh, the owners were like, we'll give you a little bit of money now, but know that we come in to get them checks. So our joke about James Dolan, I'm sure he's going to be the first one knocking at the door on May 15th, say, yo, 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 <laughs> where that money? Run me my money. So, but I'm glad that the PA was able to actually agree to the terms. That's what's really important so that there's no angst or contention amongst these two groups as we deal with COVID-19. All right. Announcement of a retirement taking place. Trevor Booker, you know, played a, a, a substantially um, long career here. Um, he is now announcing his retirement. Pretty young, though, at age 32, stepping away from the game. Uh, but definitely one of those role players, man, um, a, a bulldog on the on the boards. Uh, definitely going to be missed. Uh, as a role player, I'm sure, for some teams if they needed the book to do his thing. Yeah, Booker, he was one of those guys who started to understand where the game was going. He expanded to be, he was able to shoot the three ball. You know, always was a pretty good rebounder and just a great teammate in person. Had a great opportunity to interview him a couple of years ago. Um, I believe that was for Dime Magazine when I was still with them. And just, just again, just a good cat. So wish him farewell and wish him well on his travels. I'm sure we'll still be seeing him. Like as I said, he's a smart guy, so he'll probably already be involved in some of the various apps aspects of career um, wealth, so to speak, and making sure that his name is stayed out there in some aspect. All right, first round draft pick in the 2010 NBA draft selected by the Minnesota Timberwolves. And a little tidbit, did you know that Jordan Hill was his cousin? <laughs> I did not know that. Ah, there we go, man. Yeah, pulling them out, pulling them out. Props to basketball reference for writing the info. Uh, Calvin Booth, he has now been promoted to GM for the Denver Nuggets. Uh, we, we probably figured that this was what was going to happen. The Denver Nuggets are going to go internal in um, as far as their GM selection process. Yeah, man. Again, another former player just doing his damn thing after after retirement and doing it well. Kind of under the spotlight there in, in, in Denver. In the background, now he gets to shine a little bit more. Um, with Carson Novus moving on to Chicago. So, shouts to Calvin Booth and what he's been able to do on the Denver Nuggets franchise. All right. And Aldo, you know how we do. We always like to end on a fun note. Unfortunately, we will end on a sad note of our coast-to-coast uh, the big cat's mother, uh, Carl Anthony Towns' mother, passes away due to complications of the COVID-19 virus. Uh, clearly, we know, we know, we know, relish in anybody losing anyone, but especially hits hardest when it's a part of the NBA family. Yeah, that's really tough. You know, cat, uh, very emotional video he posted when when she was sick. Um, and, and that she was finding and struggling, you know, to make it. And unfortunately, she was unable to pull through. And as an NBA family, we definitely send our condolences to, to him, to her, to his whole family, and to all the people who have lost lives, you know, to the families of those who've lost you lost loved ones as missed COVID-19. Um, this thing is literally a killer. And we've just got to make sure that we stay home and do our best to flatten the curve and, and you know, make sure that we can protect what we love. Um, but definitely, definitely sad, sad news for, for Kat and the rest of the NBA family. Yeah, once again, um, our thoughts and our prayers to the Towns family, um, you know, in regards to this passing. And, you know, we hopefully, um, you know, they can move on and beyond this. And, you know, listen, uh, I would expect that Carl Anthony Towns is going to be playing his ass off, you know, until he hangs up those, you know, those shoes, those uh, those kicks, man, um, because his number one fan was his mom. And it was always great seeing her out there supporting his, his son in those games. Um, it's a tough loss, but definitely, um, I think that it's going to inspire him to be even, you know, better, uh, than he's already been so far in the league. All things considered, Shaw, wow, what a hell of a show that we've been able to put together. Um, just so great to be able to have Christina Williams on board from Girl Talk Sports TV. Um, she's just doing some phenomenal work. And again, man, she's right in the heart of it. WNBA is just thriving, even though this pandemic has got sports in a standstill. Hey, man, never stop a woman from keeping it moving, bro. She's busy. <laughs> she's definitely one of the, the more busy people I know um, in, in social media and in the media just in general. Um, and shouts to what she's been able to do and continues to do in the WNBA space, but in the in the sports space as well, too. She's in the fashion. She's all over the place. Like, Christina has got it locked. She's one of the hardest people working out there. So, so glad she was able to take a few minutes and, and, and lighten our fans and listeners about what's going on in the W. You know, we've got the lingo now going as well, too. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope that we're able to bring her back on at some point as well to talk a little bit more WNBA. Most definitely. One once again, we like to thank you and yours for tuning in with us here on the Baseline NBA podcast. Just as a quick update, be sure to check out Shaw and myself as we will be doing a special post 
game uh, post wrap up with regards to the docu series that will be uh, released over the next few weeks regarding the Last Dance. Shaw and I's uh, depiction of it. We are saving the Last Dance, and we're saving it for you. So be sure to catch us when we release out that um, that that post. Uh, show wrap up we'll be doing it each and every single week due to the duration of the series so be sure to check us out at nba baseline for the baseline cali warren shaw we appreciate you guys you know we do we'll catch up with you 